Paleo Runner Podcast is devoted to finding better ways to live, run, train, and eat. I'm your host, Aaron Olson. You can find more information by going to paleorunner.org. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a review. Search for Paleo Runner in iTunes and click Ratings and Reviews. You can also follow me on Facebook.com slash RunPaleo or on Twitter at RunPaleo. I wanted to take a minute to let you know about a product I've been using called 3Fuel. 3Fuel is a sports drink that gives you fat, protein, and carbohydrates to use as a fuel source. Unlike sugar sports drinks, 3Fuel gets absorbed slowly into your bloodstream to give you sustained energy throughout your workout. If you'd like to give it a try, you can get 10% off by using the coupon code 3FOLSON. Go to paleorunner.org and click 3Fuel at the top of the page. If you're listening through the podcast app on iPhone, click the link displayed on the app right now. My guest today is Katie Bowman. Katie directs the Restorative Exercise Institute, where she teaches people how to move pain-free. Her latest book is called Aligned and Well, and if you're listening to the podcast app on your iPhone, you can actually order the book right now by clicking the link displayed on the app. Katie, thanks for being part of the show. Hey, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Katie, it's great to talk to you today. Tell me a little bit more about how you got interested in movement and alignment and reducing injuries. Well, I am a biomechanist, which is um, uh, it's someone who focuses on the, the physics of how people move, and it's a it's a program that's within at least in the United States under the umbrella of kinesiology. So you're studying um, human movement. That's what kinesiology means. And um, but biomechanics is a real particular point of view that is saying like what are the what are the lever systems? What are the loads? What are the for- like the Newtonian forces? Pressure, compression, gravity, and how do those create specific um, outcomes in the body. So you can look at human movement and analyze it on the bigger scale, like arms and legs and the hinges, the knees and the hips, and say, okay, how the, the angles of these joints and the way the angles line up with the gravitational force creates too much friction in this case, or creates an excessive amount of quadricep use, but would minimize the hamstring use. And, and so physical therapists and biomechanical researchers are, are looking at what are the repetitive use patterns and the loads that are created through those patterns and what kind of um, injuries come about when you use your body in a particular way. And then, you know, if you do that for many, many years, you get a nice um, grid that helps you understand that how someone moves can be a predictor in the types of injuries that you get. So I was just always fascinated as a personal trainer when I did my undergraduate in biomechanics. I worked, you know, just in the field working with people pursuing fitness or um, athletic uh, endeavors. But because I was degreed and I was kind of specialized in injuries and levers, I got all the people who were broken, people who had already had ACL repairs or had bulging discs. And so I, I got to spend a lot of time doing my own sort of field work with this population and um, having that biomechanical eye, I could really see what exercises, which correctives would help. And then I started to see maybe did certain patterns of injury and like, oh, well, these other things would be helpful because you and the and the anthropometric dimensions that you have, right? So like say you have a long torso and shorter legs or say you have really long arms and then the habits that you have, like say you love rowing or say that you're a cyclist, I could see the injuries that you were going to get in the future so that I could give them basically what they would get in physical therapy later on up front so that they didn't have to wait until they had the injury. They could get it before the energy, the injury ensued. So that that's kind of my, my particular path. And then of course I started putting it in videos and books and then I started teaching other just layman people or physical therapists, medical doctors, and then just the person who just is loves kind of intuitively biomechanics, mm. um, how, how to see, how to see, um, how to quantify body position, how to assess body position, and then how to um, think of the correctives in terms of exercise and, and then how to how to do it professionally. Okay, interesting. So, you know, you talked a lot about the, the system of the human body and kind of taking uh, your physics background and, and, and using that to understand how we move and how things can go wrong. Um, what do you think, uh, you know, the body is so complex and like you take the human foot, which has a ton of different bones and tendons. Can it really be just reduced to physics? Is that really, if you take physics, can you figure out why we get injured? Is it that simple? Well, it's not physics, it's biomechanics. So biomechanics okay. is a different field than physics. And I think that that might be the bigger issue that people, um, people will apply basic physical principles to biological tissue, like rigid mechanics. Like, okay, here's this lever system and here's this lever system over here. And therefore, 
or this is the force and um, this is the injury rate. Uh, and that will give you a nice kind of window because the physical laws are the same, but the body isn't a rigid body. So Newtonian physics don't really apply very well because your body is not, your body's flexible. Even something like a hard tissue, like a bone is mm-hmm. still, is still flexible. So when you apply a force, like say, for example, your arms all the way out and you're holding a kettlebell in your arm. If I was a physicist, I would say, okay, here's the length of your arms. I draw them out and here is the mass of your arms. And, and here's the, you know, I could create a whole free body diagram for it. But what that free body diagram can't account for is that the bone itself bends. Like you have joint distortion, but you also have a bony deformation. And so it becomes a little bit more complicated when you're applying physics to a biological tissue. And so that's what biomechanics is. It's you have to have a really robust understanding of biology, and then you're going, okay, how does that bending of the arm, not the movement of the shoulder, not the deltoid contraction, not the basic stuff that you think of, you know, as a personal trainer, but how does that bending of the bone stimulate the um, osteocyte inside the bone, and what kind of stress pattern do you get, and what kind of bone density increase or decrease do you get, and 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 do you do it though at a frequency where a bone spur may develop, and then what about your fraction pattern? Like it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And the answer is yes, biomechanics can give you quite a bit of understanding about how external forces create injuries. But you have to first reframe an injury in your mind to be some sort of cellular disruption. And that's all an injury is. An injury is a disruption to the way the cells are behaving. And then the more you understand how movement translates into cellular stimulation, which is a a process called mechanotransduction. So the more you understand that, you know, even if it's something like a a plantar fasciitis is like, oh, I have inflamed fascia. Well, that's just a really large perspective. If you get down to the level of the cells, it's like, what is the rearrangement of the cells and what sort of load conditions have you placed on them? And then things start to make a little bit more sense. And then changing load profiles becomes a little bit more easier to uh, address. Okay. So can you tell me, I know towards the end there, you were, you were talking about how the cells, how, how that's actually how we get injured and, and the load profiles that are put on that, on the cells. Tell me a little bit more about your view of injuries and why we get injured in the first place. Um, well, I, I would say that most of the people listening to this podcast um, are all within the same culture that I am. Like it's a, it's a tech-based culture. It's a commerce-based culture. It's a modern, you know, we're not hunter-gatherers. So we all have grown up, you know, wearing shoes and and sitting most of the time, even even all of you guys out there who are excellent exercisers, competitive athletes, comparatively speaking to populations that do not have their food available to them in a store, you know, um, who has to physically expend quite a bit of energy to both gather and then cultivate the food that they're able to extract calories from. We're sedentary. We're extremely sedentary. So the load profiles are in this culture um, extremely lower than the biological requirements for maintaining the function of our tissues. And so we're we're all we all have uh, our own unique movement profile, right? You know, depending on the type of sport that you do, the activities that you had as a kid, what your home life was like, the shoes that you've worn, your anthropometric dimensions, which are your size and shape, as I mentioned before, um, how your parents moved. All of these things go into this big nebulous um, equation and the, the output that spit out on the other end is the shape of your body right now, both both literal and, and uh, metaphorical. Mm. Um, so a lot of people like say, oh, I'm in shape or I'm out of shape, meaning, you know, my fitness level is up or down. But what I'm talking about is the literal shape of your body, the shapes of your bones and the densities of your bones, um, the type of uh, collagen genetics that are expressed are all based on your load profile that you've done throughout your life. And the injury that you that you have is the difference between the way you have moved over your whole entire life and the way you would have moved had you grown up in a um, an, in a mod, like a tech free convenience free context, which means that you had to work for every single thing that you had. Mm. So y- you kind of mentioned that ancestral view, and that's something that we talk a lot about on this podcast. Is that a lot of the things in our modern world are very convenient, but sometimes they can actually cause more problems um, than we realize. So you kind of it sounds like uh, subscribe to that sort of mismatch hypothesis that you know there's there are things that we're doing that that might not be advantageous for us and that 
could actually cause harm. Do you have any examples that you come to mind that some things that we, we use um, in the modern world that might actually be causing us injury? Well, I would say you could probably um, create an argument for anything that you use. Um, it's, you know, like I had mentioned before, shoes, chairs, toilets, cars, you know, these are all these are all things that um, reduce in the easiest sense, they reduce, they reduce the quantity of movement, right? You know, you don't walk around. But like, say, a chair. If you didn't have a chair, think about all the loads that you would be placing on your knees and your hips getting up and down off the floor, um, you know, 40 times a day. So people people take those, you know, joint configurations. Like, okay, say you just sit on the floor and you just squat down. Or say you get down and you sit cross-legged. Like, these are loads that your bodies would have done multiple times throughout the day, every single day of your life, that they have have never done or done to a, you know, a, such a low number where it's less than 1% of the amount of time that you would have gotten. So what people do now is they try to go to yoga class, right? You try to recreate those loads in a real concentrated, like one hour, three times a week way, um, which is good. It's better than not doing it at all. But the way that mechanotransduction works is frequency and distribution of loads is just as important as the types of load profiles that you're creating. So it's not, it's kind of how I delineate between um, natural movement and natural movements with an S. So like you can say, hey, a squat's a natural movement, so I'm going to squat. But if you do a squat like an exercise, like 20 times in a row, the outcome will still be different than if you just squat sprinkle throughout the day, each one a slightly different nuanced squat. So mm. it is, it's very similar to that, the paleo nutritional um, point of view. And so mm. I would say that you would definitely have to subscribe or at least kind of follow the the, mo the evolutionary model that the tissues that you have right now require the inputs that were around as you were evolving. Like that's that would be the that would be the platform. And we've seen it in other animals in captivity. And so kind of like the diseases that we have, I've just been I'm working on the next big book that kind of explains this. And, and I try to call a lot of the stuff that we just have culturally the diseases of captivity because they're just the 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 <laughs> load prof the load profiles that are created by a situation where movement movement and all sorts of movements are not required and then also coupled with unfortunately high volumes of movement within a context of being sedentary the rest of the time. Mm, okay. So, you know, you're you talk a lot about alignment and getting the proper alignment. It, it sounds like um are, when you mention that is is that about getting the bones in the right alignment or moving them in the correct way or getting your muscles in alignment? What does that actually mean and how how can we how can we use that idea of alignment to help someone who say is dealing with a running injury. Well, yeah, I mean, the alignment is a, is a multiple level phenomenon. I think most people confuse alignment with posture. So mm -hmm. posture is um, in a in a couple of sentences, I would say that posture is the way that something looks, but alignment is the way something works. It has more to do with the loads that are created than it has to do with the physical appearance, although the physical appearance of something helps you evaluate what loads are being created. So, you know, if you if you stand, for example, if everyone stands, um, but say some people stand with their pelvis way out in front of them or some people um, will push their head way forward. If you've ever seen someone walking down the street and it looks more like their body on top is way out and falling and their legs are just catching up or or say that you lift your chest very high and there's all these kind of um, uh, parameters for good posture, but they tend to be more about a certain aesthetic. Um, there's a lot of research on the way we communicate with our bodies. You know, you'll posture to say something. Um, but when I talk about alignment, I'm really more um, concerned with the load profiles that are created by your body's position relative to gravity, both when you're static, when you're standing still, but also when you're moving. So, I mean, you go and take your car to the mechanic to fix your alignment. The mechanic isn't finding the nicest way to present your wheels, you know, and it's not finding um, a, a single position to fix your wheels in. What your mechanic is doing is your mechanic is trying to find the the weight distribution and the loads placed upon the tires by the axle through the weight of the car, also considering the driving conditions so that you m maximize all of the tissues, or in this case, it would be your materials of your car so that you do not wear out one particular spot or, or material before everything else. I mean, everything has its kind of set wear point, but when you start wearing out one, one tire before another, tire when you're creating excessive wear and tear and then you know which translates for us as a consumer into like more dollars like oh I got to repair replace my tire sooner than later or my ball bearings on this side aren't working well like 
there's all of these forces that are being calculated, and that's what alignment means for movement as well. It's not about static positioning. However, if you're a runner and you and you notice um, that you have, I don't know, uh, an, uh, like medial knee pain, right? So like, mm-hmm. and it, but it's only on one side. Then what that does is it gives you insight that there's something happening within the way that you run, the form, if you will, where the loads placed on that knee are higher. And some injuries come with loads that are too low. So with biology, it's more complex because every tissue has its like optimal loading point. More is not better. Like you can't end adapt to more um, but also you know like cars under use of a material also has breakdown properties or if you underuse like for people who do cardio if you under strain your cardiovascular system specifically if you underuse muscles a lot then the capillary beds within those areas have a decreased amount of capillaries your body will will pull back the tissues because there's no point in keeping and nourishing capillaries that you don't use and so you've got a whole lot lot of tissue that reduces in mass um, based on the way that you use it. So it's this it's this biological point, very similar to when you're trying to balance an ecosystem, right? You want to introduce some animals because you want some output, but then those animals consume another animal. So now you got too low another animal and then you got to bring in some other species. So trying to manage nature is... Um, <laughs> it's it's an endless pursuit. Like you can't manage nature, so that's why I that's why I'm a fan of I think the evolutionary perspective because I think it's very cocky perspective that you can that you can somehow manage it mm-hmm. um, instead of just a let it flourish in a certain situation. Okay, so you just mentioned that it's pretty difficult to manage a biological system. So let's just take an example. Say there's a runner, and you know back pain is a huge issue. Um, how would you go about? you know, figuring out where that back pain is coming from and then helping that person get back into proper alignment so that they're not, I mean, it's, it almost sounds, is it, is it kind of like chiropractic where you have to, where they feel like they have to get the bones back into alignment? I mean, you talked about how the pain someone might experience, but how would you go about helping someone in that situation? Well, I think what's different about the way that I work and the way that I teach people to work is I see alignment as, a, like I said, a multi-layered phenomenon. So there is absolutely a component of, uh, hey, runner, we're going to do a, I, I want you to stand and I want you to put all your bodies on these points so that I can see where you have mobilities and where you don't. Alignment is like a grid that allows you to assess. Um, it's not a, a grid or a plane that you have to move on indefinitely, but you can't quantify something unless you can objectively measure it and so you have to use a grid to do so so there's that phase of okay runner you're going to come in and i want you to stand in your most relaxed position okay look down at your feet do you see how this foot points off in this direction and this one goes off here and let's look at the back of the knees and can we see how your hamstring tendons are aligned differently on this one leg than the other leg and um, let's you know let's look at the amount of hip extension that you have and do you see how you've got greater hip extension on one side than the other side which means that when you move forward all All of your loads are not translating down to equal stimulation. And so, um, you know, the classic way would be, um, hey, your glute, your left glute is not firing as much as your right glute. So let's build up your left glute by doing, you know, more hip extension on the left side than the right side. And that's not really a perspective I take because I think that people misunderstand muscle balance to mean making them equal. And my perspective is we want them to be used equally naturally. And mm. you might have a, a problem with too much recruitment on one side. So to bring the other side up to be unnaturally high in recruitment um, is not really a long-term solution, nor is it a more natural solution. But so that being said, the structural alignment part is definitely something that we do. But this, but the the more important part that I could offer that runner would be let's look at your behavioral alignment. So how much do you sat at work for eight hours today um, and you have no range of motion in your hips or your knees and you go running for, you know, 13 miles or five miles or whatever it is. And let's look at your feet. Your feet have no mobility. Like what are, what, how do all of the other ways you spend your time also contribute to the injury that you have? So um, it would be like also include recommendations for you need to 
convert your your sitting time into some standing workation time as well as you need to be sitting on the floor and get rid of you know your comfy couch practice for at least 30 minutes every day because the loads that you create you create loads 100% of the time and you do not adapt to the thing that you do like you're not adapting to your running bout any more than you're adapting to the 15 hour sitting bout that you did mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. your tissue your tissue shape matches what you do most frequently not what you do most enthusiastically okay okay so you mentioned they're getting rid of possibly getting rid of your couch time and um i think a lot of people would have a hard time with that um i've heard that you've gotten rid of a lot of the furniture in your house is that true <laughs> it is true i there's a tour you can see a tour of my house online but yes i i and just to clarify i have plenty of furniture i just don't have things to sit on like there's tables and there's um you know art on the wall and there's beds there's just not there's no couch there's no chairs our dining room table is just like most of the world uses which is without chairs like these are radical i would say to the, <laughs> the american listener like what are you insane but the most most of the world does not use a chair this uh, is this is, is not a radical t- what's that is your dinner table uh, how is it like at standing level then or how does no, that work it's sitting just like okay. like um, most asian most asian like traditional tables so okay. it's, it's a foot off the floor and okay. you know it's, it's on a carpet and we have cushions and we just sit on them and, and eat on the ground because i don't have time like most people most people would say that the reason they don't eat better or move more is because they don't have time mm-hmm. they see they see doing things for their health as time consuming well it does not take me any more time to sit on the floor to eat than it does to sit in a chair only i got during my 20 minutes of sitting down on the floor what people have to go to yoga class to get or what people have to set outside of their lives to get and that's a really huge point is we are trying to get healthier without changing the behaviors that are in fact making us unhealthy and that's just a mathematical equation that's never going to work out Mm -hmm. ever Mm -hmm. so what is the success like at your clinic i mean people come in obviously you help a lot of people with injuries what do you is it something that you can track or you know tell me about uh, someone a runner say or someone who's come in who has plantar fasciitis and and gotten better is that something that you see often yeah very very common i mean as far as like it's hard to track you know with people's pain sensation it's really hard to quantify um it on paper you know or to to prove it where with with our outcomes of of, uh, osteoporosis are better because we actually have dexa we have bone density scans Mm. before and after so like those are better data collections for us it's like hey i'm 60 and i had decreased bone mass in my lumbar our spine and it's increased. Same thing that goes with the femur or the ribs. So we've got good tracking that way, but there's plenty of people who come in um, with general general stuff like just like chronic back pain that maybe was undiagnosed specifically, like if it was bulging disc or, or you know, whatever. Um, but then we have people who do have specific diagnoses and just don't wish to um, pursue surgical routes because the success of the surgeries are, you know, very, they're, they, a lot of times they'll provide short relief, but the effect isn't sustainable or the intervention itself to stabilize something. Like if you're going to fuse your back, well, from a physical, from a physics point of view, when you fuse vertebrae to deal with one problem, you basically now have a longer lever where you haven't done anything to fix your actual problem of what allowed the vertebrae to move and bend in the first place unnaturally. So so now you just kept the problem of a natural movement and gave it a higher, greater leverage. So now the problem goes, oh, now I have to get the inferior or superior, the, the vertebrae above or below fixed as well. So it doesn't matter if you're a person who wants to, you know, not go down the surgical route or if you're someone who is going to go down the surgical route, but you just want to make sure that your what you do sticks better. Um, I think anyone could benefit incredibly from understanding how they work. Like just we, we start with super busy basic physics principles and levers and then as people study more and more they get more um we get more in depth but i try to meet everyone at the level where they are right now which is very little math or science training or medical or even health training they just have this body that isn't working right and we give them some stuff to start playing around with adjusting their pelvis adjusting their feet we look at everyone's footwear you know and say okay if you're in a positive heeled shoe there's no point in adjusting your back and your neck and your shoulders if the very platform that you stand on all day is creating an angle that's in the wrong direction for your joint. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So 
are, do doctors send patients to you? Or are you kind of an independent person who helps people? And and if someone's really interested in what you're saying, you know, they might be injured at this time while they're, while they're listening. Um, how can they go about, you know, getting help? Um, is Do they have to go out and see you or is there another way? Can they read your books? Uh, yeah, well, actually, I don't even see people any longer. I had a clinic uh, for 10 years in Ventura, California. And yes, all of the doctors, I provided a lot of continuing education for them because it's a field that they, they're not really trained in exercise or, or diet, really. You know, they, mm. they follow kind of more of the, the government basic surgeon general guidelines or the uh, RD guidelines, which aren't necessarily the best as, you know, people I think are becoming more aware of, mm-hmm. um, even though they might be the safest, you know, about minimizing stuff. But yeah, we have a lot of um, a lot of referrals to the clinic. But now what I do is I just teach other health practitioners. So that's if you're going to see somebody, you would go see someone who I've trained and you can find someone local to you um, or like via a Skype session. But really what I spend most of my time doing is writing books to help people do this themselves. Like you can always, you can keep going to a health practitioner to learn, um, you know, like what exercise should I do or whatnot, but it's kind of like always having a chef. Like you, at a certain point, you have to learn how to cook for yourself. You have to understand how to select your own foods. And we give you real basic parameters to start with, kind of like in the food world that's what? It's organic, fresh, um, unpackaged. Like there's all these really big um, categories that you can start consuming your food in that make a huge difference. So I kind of do the same thing with movements. Like let's look at sitting, let's look at standing, let's look at these real simple foot, pelvis, rib cage positions, like really big categories that anyone can learn to measure themselves with. And most people get better by just understanding three or four super basic properties of position and movement quantity and frequencies in the same way that just small changes to your diet, you know, get rid of abundant sugars, get rid of processed foods makes all the difference in the world. And then if you're a foodie, you know, you start getting into, oh, I got to soak my nuts before I Mm. eat my nuts. The same thing with movement. You start becoming more nuanced, a better consumer of movement education because you've, you're starting to see movement in a way that's as complex as how you see food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, Katie, it's been great talking with you today. Where do you recommend listeners go to find out more about you? Um, Well, you can start, I mean, if you're like, hey, I want to start reading and I want to start reading right now, you can go to Katie Says and it's uh, K-A-T-Y says.com and there's, I don't know, 300 articles that you can start reading through. They're all categorized for you. Um, and then my first five years, the five years that are before the articles that are now on the blog there are all um, organized in a book called Alignment Matters. That's a good place to start and you can download a copy of it um, or you can order a hard copy of it on the that website or on Amazon. And that's, a, that's the best place to start. There's also, if you go to Katie Says, it's like, I'm overwhelmed. Where do I start? <laughs> that will tell you. That will tell you where to go. And then you can also go to the institute is restorativeexercise.com. And there's a bunch of free classes that you can take. There's hours. There's there's probably 100 hours of free materials there. Like, I don't, I'm, I'm kind of even over the um, profiting. Like, it's not, it's like a non-profit. It's not a non-profit because I get paid to do what I do. But it's, it's just about educating the public on something that I think is super essential. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Katie, thanks again. It's been great talking with you today. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You've been listening to another episode of Paleo Runner Podcast. For more information, go to paleorunner.org. Thanks for listening.